There we go. Okay. And now we are live. Hello, everybody. We're just going to wait a minute or two just for participants to start filtering in. Actually, let's see. We have three so far. Here we go. Hey, Daniel, Ned. Hello. Right. Do we have a few? How many do we have then? There's three, two? Uh, we, we have uh, seven and two on the phone. Seven and two on the phone. Very good. Okay. So I think that's a good time to start then. Yeah. Okay, in. cool. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Eric C. Fuentes. I am an adaptive technologies instructor here at the Travis Association for the Blind. Today's presentation is named Cooking with Confidence, and hopefully will instill a few tips, tricks, and other ways for your, you as a blind and visually impaired person to navigate your way around the kitchen and the grill uh, more safely and effectively. Uh, we're not trying to make you chefs, but we are trying to make you efficient and proficient uh, around the stove, grill, and whatever else that you may use to, <laughs> to make whatever it is that you want to make to eat. Today's presentation, I'll be joined by my fellow colleagues, uh, Aaron Hoffman, Lead Adaptive Technology Instructor, Dan Hart, Accessibility and Data Specialist, Data and Accessibility Specialist, and longtime TAB employee, Han Tran. <clears throat> so to, throughout the duration of the presentation, we will pause for you to ask questions or give comments and to do so, people on Mac or uh, for Windows and Mac to input questions into the chat field. It's Alt H for Windows and Command plus Y on Macs. If you, I'm sorry, it's Command plus H on Macs and Alt plus H on Windows. That is to input text messages into the chat box. If you want to talk to us directly, it is Alt plus Y and Command plus Y on both Windows and Mac, respectively. This will raise your hand and will allow us to add you to the discussion so you can verbally ask us questions. Again, we'll pause throughout the duration of the discussion to sort of let you guys ask questions and chip, uh, chime in here. So without further ado, let's jump right into things. Today, again, it's Cooking with Confidence where we'll be discussing just little tips, tricks, and tools, different things and techniques that we as blind people have used in the kitchen throughout our blind lives and or, or uh, other things from our sighted times that we implement uh, in our daily kitchen experiences because honestly that's one of the most uh, that's one of the most challenging things is just overcoming the uh, transition or the uh, ability to be able to know when something's ready, when something's ready to eat or when something's finished, or just a simple fear of overcoming fire or heat on an electric stove, if you will. So without further ado, today, uh, let me kick it over to Aaron Hoffman, who's going to kick things off with a little gadget that's been gaining quite a lot of popularity amongst the visually impaired community. It's called the Instapot. I know a lot of people who use it, and Aaron's going to give us a brief overview. I know he uses it in his daily uh, cooking needs. I think he uses it more than standard kitchen <laughs> wear. So take it away, Aaron. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. The Instant Pot is a pressure cooker, and many people will remember the pressure cooker that we had oh, from years ago. But this is a smart pressure cooker. It's much more than a pressure cooker, actually. It will make your meats, your stews, whatnot. But it can also do rices, it can do chili, it can do poultry, it can do so many other things. It's a multi-cooker. So it's not just a one-trick pony. And the great thing for us as BVIs is it is also accessible. 
we have Wi-Fi versions available. We can use Google Nest, we can use Alexa to talk to it. Not necessarily quite yet, but we have apps we can find recipes for, and the apps are accessible, the recipes are very easy, and it's very fun to gain your confidence and learn how to cook. I could barely boil water before I started, but I was able to make a fantastic turkey Greek soup tonight with the Instant Pot. And the Instant Pot itself is laid out a bit cylindrical, and we have four rows of buttons, six buttons on the left, six buttons on the right. And on the left and right, we have specialty buttons. The nice thing about the specialty buttons we have is you press it once, or you say something like, Alexa, cook beans. And there are specialty programs built in there. It will set the pressure, it will set the time, just one touch, touch and go. Very nice. And we have buttons here for soups and rice, beans, meat, poultry. And we also have common cookware features. We have sauteing and steaming and pressure cooking. So it's really a nice all-in-one device. There are some great safety features for us, such as a very high uh, pot that you cook in so you don't have to worry about spilling when you're sauteing something. It's just giant like cooking in a stock pot. So you don't have to worry about spilling onto the uh, heating element. And it's large area means you can clean it very easily. It's dishwasher friendly. You can clean it without much hassle and you can pick it up with normal um, oven mitts when you're done. And the buttons are a little bit tactile, which makes it nice. They're laid out in the same fashion and you can use keyboard keys. That's what I have at home here. Or you can also use puff paint or braille if it'll stick on. I don't have the Wi-Fi version available. There is a Wi-Fi version, a Bluetooth ver version, and there's a regular dumb version, but it's still quite smart, smarter than I used to be. And the smart versions will actually connect to the iPhone and Alexa and Google Nest. You could say something like, hey Alexa, pressure cook for 10 minutes, or hey Alexa, cook rice. It'll know what you mean, and it'll set that for you. You can even say, hey Alexa, what's my Instant Pot doing? And just say something like, your Instant Pot is currently preheating for 10 minutes on a poultry cycle. And one of the nicest features I've known about it is the delay timer. You can set something up in the morning. You can set a delay timer for, let's say, six hours or seven hours. And when you come home, your food will be ready. Because seven hours, then it'll kick on. Your food will be ready. It'll pressure cook. It'll be nice they're ready for you when you come home. And there are also many recipe apps available for the Instant Pot. Since it's a traditional pressure cooker, there are apps for iOS and Android. You can also find recipes online, uh, All Recipes and Food Network. Those are very good. Let's see. And there are other options on the Instant Pot, for example, keeping it warm. If you need to keep soups or such warm for, let's say two hours or so. And it will also turn off, it will auto shut off, which is great. And the venting lid, when you're pressure cooking, you can cook foods very quickly with it. When it's done cooking, you can release the pressure naturally. You can wait there 10 minutes and it'll release the pressure very slowly or you can release it, it's called quick release. And when you release it, you'll have a nice shot of steam coming out, so you be careful, you don't burn anything. When I first started cooking with it, I learned very quickly that you don't put heavily salted items in there for making broths or whatnot, because it will clog up the elements, and when you release it, it will release a jet of broth into the air, and you'll paint your ceiling orange. And <laughs> speaking of cooking, I have a very small recipe to share with you if you'd like to try it yourselves. It's a small recipe for sweet Japanese omelets. And we also have this recipe available in the handout, so you can request it and it'll be there for you under the Instant Pot heading. And for the recipe, it's a very simple one. It's just eight eggs, 
one fourth cup water, one tablespoon and one teaspoon soy sauce, one tablespoon and one teaspoon white sugar. And the process is very simple. Whisk the ingredients together in a bowl and you set your instant pot to saute. Press the saute once. It'll beep to let you know it's ready. Pour a little few drips of water in there. You can hear it's, okay, it's ready. You'll pour it in there and you'll wait about three to five minutes. You'll fold it over twice and then you can get a spatula, take it out. Then you press the cancel button, then it's ready to go. A very simple cleaning, very simple uh, eating. And the Instant Pot really gives you confidence to try new things and explore uh, new ways of cooking, new methods for uh, just expanding your boundaries. I never thought I'd be making omelets in the morning. I never thought I'd be making giant batches for the whole week. It's very exciting to know that you can increase your confidence with small three ingredient recipes and then know you're making a four course meal for friends. And the Instant Pot lets you do that and it's accessible. So if you haven't tried the Instant Pot yet, I highly advise you could find the Wi-Fi versions. There are versions called the Duo, and the six quart, eight quart. And there are Wi-Fi versions which connect to your phone or Alexa or the Google Nest. There are also Bluetooth versions. Those are older versions, but the Wi-Fi wi -Fi version is currently the one to get. It's the most accessible that we know of right now. Hello. Alrighty. Thank you, Aaron. As we all know, the Instapot, <laughs> but when, when I first heard of it, I always thought that the Instapot was just something that you use to, you know, oh, it's just a crock pot. You make stews and beans with it, nothing else. But come to know that you can actually make steak in it. You could sear some steak on it, <laughs> or you could make omelets, as Aaron said. It's actually really cool. I'll be talking about sauteing a little bit later, and I want to try this, but because the Instapot has such a big lip, it's hard to knock things out of it, really. I mean, you really got to be churning really hard for something to fly out of there because it's so deep and it's got such a big lip. So again, it's really diverse. And again, as Aaron just said, it's very accessible. So again, if anyone has any questions about the Instapot or any of the following topics that we're going to discuss, please, Alt-Y to raise your hand. Command Y or star nine to raise your hand on the telephone. I forgot to mention that star nine will also allow you to talk to us. Now, let's okay. kick it over to Dan. He's going to take us outside to the grill because Dan plays with fire and he doesn't get burned. So that's really cool. And Dan's going to tell us how he does it. So take it away, Dan. Hey, All hey, right. Sorry to interrupt. Eric, we have a hand up. I believe it was Isa that had his hand up. All right. Um, Isa, go ahead. <clears throat> uh oh. Uh oh. Go. So you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Oh, there we go. There you go. Hey, Isa. Um, so. I heard a lot of different exciting things that you can do with the Instant Pot. But what about frying chicken and, you know, different fried goods like that? How do you uh, fry a chicken with a bone? Can you fry a whole chicken, a half chicken? Can you tell me something about that, please? I, I can definitely. Uh, I haven't actually fried, used my Instant Pot to fry, but yes, you can fit whole chickens in them. You can get Instant Pots of different sizes, uh, half chickens, whole chickens. Um, you can put probably, Biscuits. you could probably put about eight to 10 boneless, skinless chicken breasts in the one that I've got. I think I've got a 15 quart Ooh. Instant Pot. Yeah, I got one of the big guys. So yeah, you can get them big, you can get them small, and uh, what are yeah. the price ranges for those? 
different sizes. They're very reasonably priced. One I had was around $80 for the eight quart model and around 60 for the uh, six quart model before. I think I paid about 150 for mine. And uh, like Aaron was saying, it's got, uh, mine's got the buttons on the, on the front. The button on the upper left-hand corner is for stews. The button right below it is for meat, which is what I use for all my, like the chickens and the, the fajita meat and all that. Mm -hmm. Button in the upper right-hand corner is actually for rice. And all that's doing when you're hitting those different buttons is it's, is it's setting it to a different time. Um, and it knows to, you know, uh, go for five minutes, 10 minutes, 40 minutes, gives it a little bit of a cool down, a little bit of a different temperature there for the different, uh, for the different settings, I believe. So it's a, it's a really nice little gadget. Very nice. Thank you so much, Issa, Thank for that you. question. Cool. Cool. All right. So if anyone else has some questions, please don't hesitate. Alt Y, raise your hand, or just drop something in the chat box. So go ahead and take it away, Dan. All righty. So yes, I do play with fire. No, I do not get burned. Um, <laughs> I actually um, barbecued this weekend and uh, or, uh, smoked some meat this weekend. A couple of tools that I've picked up over uh, the last uh, months or years or whatever. The most recent item that I've picked up that I use for both barbecuing and for smoking is a pair of barbecue gloves. These gloves are really, really nice. Uh, I've got some pretty big hands. Um, I'm 6'1", and so I'm a pretty big guy, but these gloves actually come up to uh, probably about two thirds the way up my forearm. And these gloves I got off of uh, Amazon for about $16. They actually allow me to handle, say, uh, my wife was, a, um, was browning some meat. I actually picked up the pot by the, just the pot up off of the, off of the uh, burner. And I couldn't feel it at all in my, in my, in these gloves. They're great. They allow me to get up close to a fire in my, either smoker or in my barbecue it allows me and it doesn't allow me to actually go in there and actually put my hand in the fire but what it does allow me to do is it allows me to handle the second thing that I'm going to talk about which is a charcoal chimney it also allows me to put the grates on top of the uh, the flame or over the coals without having to to worry about burning my hands or or you know kind of touching the side of the of the barbecue or something it's a really good safety uh, item that I that I use. I absolutely love it. These gloves that I got off of Amazon, the ones that I got are were like $16, $17. They've got like these rubber nodule thingies on it to kind of help make it uh, non-slip. And it's just uh, like this, this very tightly woven material. And uh, it, it, there is a warning on, on them when you buy them that you do not, absolutely do not want to get them wet or to get them around steam because what it does is it traps that hot water and it will actually burn your skin if you do get them wet. However, when you're out around a barbecue or a, or a fire or anything like that, these are going to keep you good and safe. Um, H-E-B and Walmart also sell barbecue gloves. There are varying different uh, materials. I've seen them uh, with nice thick leather. So definitely want to uh, consider those when you're doing barbecuing or you're smoking some, you know, some meat. Second item that I use is a charcoal chimney. Back in the old day, back in the, I'm going to date myself here, back in the 80s, when coffee used to come in an actual can, you'd actually take and you'd cut both ends of the uh, can off, and then bam, you have a charcoal chimney. And from there, what you do is you just fill up your, your, your can with your charcoal. I do use just a little bit of lighter fluid and I stress just a little bit of lighter fluid. And what this does is, and you light it from the bottom. What this does is it, allow, is, is it starts your fire from the bottom of those coals and it goes up and you will see some flame or feel some flame come up from the top. And what that's doing is it's getting everything in the middle there nice and hot and it's going to get that that nice 
orangey glow or that that intense heat that you'll feel if you if you're if you can't see it you'll feel the intense heat and you'll just kind of feel this stillness of hot around your you know around your the area that your that your coals are in and you want your coals to to sit there in your charcoal chimney for probably about a half an hour is what I use about 20 20 to 30 minutes and it gets it makes sure that everything is good it makes sure that it's nice and warm now for a charcoal chimney a couple different ways some of them you actually have a, uh, a handle and you have to actually turn the charcoal chimney upside down or you can just lift it straight up that's the kind that I personally like is is when you can just lift it straight up keep your coals in a nice little little pile and uh, your coals will last uh, it'll last a good two three four hours depending on how many different, you know, how big your, your charcoal chimney is and how much charcoal you're using there. Uh, the third thing that I use also when I'm actually uh, adding wood onto my charcoal is a set of fireplace tongs. Those are probably about two and a half to three feet long. And um, it, all it is is it's something that you would normally use for a fireplace that you'd be putting your wood into a fireplace with. I just adapted it and I actually use it to put my wood chunks on to make sure that I stay away from my uh, uh, the open flames in my uh, in my smoker box. Alrighty, so for uh, some smoking tips, you want to make sure that your smoke is uh, is as clear as possible. What this does is it makes it to where if if your smoke is very very dense, if it's very white. You get a chemical buildup called creosote, and what that does is, if you've ever had barbecue that makes your mouth kind of kind of uh, numb or bitter, it's because there's your the fire's not breathing enough, and, and it's not uh, you've got that really thick smoke. A couple of the way that I do this because I don't see very well, I can act. You can actually hold your hand just over the smokestack or this you know wherever your smoke's coming out. You can smell it. You can actually smell it kind of real bitter. On your hand you can also feel kind of a kind of a greasy soot on your hand and uh, it does take some practice best friend of mine told me first 10 briskets don't count when you're smoking so just keep that in mind and uh, yes I have ruined many many cuts of meat but you know what it's okay you're just trying out new things and you're trying out what works for you so make sure that your smoke has a decent smell it doesn't smell bitter it doesn't, and it, and you don't have a this this slick uh, film in your in the palm of your hand. So that's a way to check out your smoke non visually. Uh, when I am smoking and I've got my my charcoal, I only add two maybe three chunks of wood at a time, and I do water soak them for about 20, 30 minutes. Helps it to to burn a little bit slower, and uh, gives it a little bit more of a smoky feel. And uh, it gives it a gives your meat a really good uh, a really good uh, a taste there. You don't want a huge fire. You keep your keep the fire small. Uh, make sure there's plenty of ventilation. If you've got a side vent on your smoker or your barbecue, definitely keep that open, and that'll help you to uh, keep that smoke nice and clear. It'll really help. The more your your fire breathes, the better the smoke will be. Uh, very important. Don't open your smoker lid until you suspect your meat is done. So once you're done with uh, my experience, chicken, fish, about three to four hours or so to, until I start measuring the uh, temperature. But it's really important that you keep that heat and you keep that smoke into, uh, into your smoker there. Um, it is important. There are different woods for different meats. For your lighter meats, pork, chicken, uh, fish. I use apple wood. You can also use uh, pecan or cherry. If I've heard is very good for a lot of the red meats. Hickory and oak. I understand is very good. I usually use hickory when I'm doing either uh, uh, beef ribs or a brisket. Uh, if you're not comfortable using an open flame, there are electric smokers or pellet type smokers out there. So pellet type smoker uh, definitely is going to be the easiest one to use. Meat tastes just as good. All it is is it's an electric smoker. You put a bunch of pellets in this little trough that sits along the side of your smoker. And all this trough does is it just feeds the pellets going through the smoker 
and it gives you that good that good smoky flavor and then the the pellets the ashes just come out the other side so that's another option that you can look at as well if you're not comfortable around an open flame but i've heard a lot of folks that want to do book uh, barbecuing and whatnot over an open flame just a few quick barbecue techniques uh again the longer the tongs you can use, the, the better to keep your hands away from that heat. Uh, again, use your barbecue gloves to protect your hands and your forearms. Again, using that charcoal chimney to help start your, your colds is really, really good. And um, you just really have to keep flipping your meat. You gotta really keep a good eye on there to make sure that it just, does, you don't want it to dry out. So the, 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 the better you keep an eye on your meat, and the better you keep an eye on your time, you know, you'll have your, your meat come out good and juicy and, and you'll get a feel for, you know, rare, medium, rare, well done, and so on and so forth. So um, those are some of the different things that I do for, for smoking and for barbecuing. All smokers are different, all barbecues are different, and just keep that in mind. So, all righty, looks like uh, Isa, let me get you unmuted here. Looks like you got a question there. Yes, sir. There you um, go. What's going on? So yeah, that was that was good about the the different grills. I have a probably a three part question for you. What type of a grill do you use? Mine is a Charmaster, and it's a smoker slash barbecue combination. So I've got the smoker box off to the side, so I can use uh, I can actually grill on the smoker box or in the smoke chamber in the bigger part of the grill, uh, I can either just use the side box for my smoke or I can also barbecue on the big side. There's an adjustable rack to bring my coals up closer to the grill and to, to let it go down to be a little bit cooler, but I can barbecue or smoke with this particular, uh, with this particular uh, grill that I've got. And you said you can have your coals um, last for two or three hours. I always have a problem with um, keeping my fire going. What do you do to keep your coals burning slow? So the way that I do this is again with the charcoal chimney, I make sure that my coals stay in a nice little pile. I don't spread them out to where it's only like a single layer of coals. I make sure that there is that my coals do sit in a pile and what I do also is I'll put on my chunks of wood on top of the coals and that helps to keep that fire going and it, it just keep it continues to help uh, feed that fire but most importantly make sure there's good ventilation uh, I will actually pull the drawer out my coals in the side of my grill sit in a, an actual drawer and I'll pull the drawer out only about an inch or so just a little enough to let a little more air go in and that helps it to burn a little bit longer and a little bit cleaner as well. Yes, um, I'm pretty good with the wood part and getting that nice and clear, but sometimes with different type of pits with too much ventilation, the charcoals always burn out very fast. Yeah, and, and you know, there, there have been times I have had that happen, for me, it, it comes down to, um, I just don't, I, either I didn't use enough charcoal to start out with, or um, I'm not out there tending my fire. You wanna make sure that you keep a good eye on your fire. And when it looks like my coals are starting to go down, or if it looks like I, I just didn't build my, my, my pile of coals enough at the beginning, um, I start adding the wood. Now I will go through a little bit more wood, but I'm out there about every 15, 20 minutes adding maybe one chunk, maybe two chunks. And um, that's, how, that's how I handle it. If my, if my uh, uh, fire starts to go down, then that's how I handle that as I just continue to add just one or two chunks at a time. You have to tend it a little bit longer and then uh, um, yeah, kind of go from there. So and you said you question. like to flip your meat a lot. Which kind of meat do you barbecue that you flip frequently? Uh, personally, when I'm barbecuing, I'll flip my, I, I like to flip my chicken about four to five times just to make sure that it's not getting hammered on the one side. 
kind of give it a rest on the on the opposite side. That's what I found kind of works for me. Could be a different technique out there that uh, you might get a little bit uh, better results out of. But that's kind of how kind of how I I handle kind of keeping the juices in my meat. <laughs> <laughs> now the um, you said you like to use fluid, and I I like to use a char charcoal chimney as well. But usually, um, well, I have the actual charcoal chimney, so it has that heating el element on the bottom that's yep. similar to a electrical stir stove burner. Yep. And yep. those two. So I just put a little paper underneath and light the paper, and then I can get it started. I really don't like using fluid, but I did find a good um, another way that might be helpful for somebody visually impaired to light a fire without fluid. And um, it's called strike a fire. Oh, yes, yes. It's like a little small plank of wood. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like buying a, a, a big matchstick box, like yep. how you can strike your match yep. on the side of it. Well, this is like a flat plank of little wood that you, they, they give you probably about 10 pieces and you strike it on the side and it only lights on that one end like a match. Right. And you lay it down and it will, then it'll start to, the fire will start to increase and it'll burn for at least 12 minutes. So it'll give you time to do your charcoal or to actually light wood if you don't want to use charcoal. I've used those for campfires. It was many, many years ago when I used those. That's a great tip for, uh, for, uh, for- and It only costs like $2. Yeah, that's a great tip. Thank you. I appreciate you at that input there. And the last question, I would like to get back to the Instapot guys. When they're saying they're frying the chicken, if you do fry chicken, which techniques do you use while frying the chicken? Me, I like my chicken finger licking good, but I don't want my chicken finger sticking good, if you know what I mean, by trying to touch it and, and whatnot. So... What kind of techniques will you use to get the chicken out? And that's my last question. Um, I personally don't fry. I don't uh, use the oil at all. Um, I just, not that I don't like it. I just, um, I personally don't, don't do a lot of frying like that. Um, Eric, Ken, Aaron, uh, do you all use, uh, do you all use oil like that? And, uh, in, uh, I've never actually used it in the Instapot. Oil, that is, that much oil. I mean, it's a very big thing. If you have one of those 8-quart, 12-quart pots, I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to use oil. Um, but the process of getting it out, that, I mean, without a basket, I guess you could use one of those, uh, well, you would lower a basket into the oil, I presume. But as far as frying, I've never really tried frying with the Instapot. If I could make a suggestion, I'd say use an air fryer because to, to my knowledge and in my experience, it, the chicken gets just as crispy as using, for example, a deep fryer, yeah, but it doesn't use as much I was going to say the oil. same thing. Uh, <clears throat> an air fryer is actually better for that. And there is one, it's a little pricey. It's the Ninja 5-in-1. It's actually really cool. It's an air fryer, but it has a grill and and all the stuff to it and and it makes your chicken or whatever you're doing really crispy and it works really well i actually used it over the weekend at my sister's house and i was going to mention an air fryer even though it's not on our list of stuff to talk about but it is something that has become very useful in these times use multiple different type of air fryers and it just just doesn't quite get the chicken like really good southern fried chicken. It does a lot of other things. I have an air fryer that I even rotisserie chicken and do all kinds of things with it. But I have to do a lot of spraying a little olive oil and stuff to get the flour to 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 get crispy right. So I know I deep fry in a pot. And if I don't have a basket, I will use a 
I will use some tongs or a big spoon with holes and then use another type of kitchenware. So when I get underneath the floating chicken, that I can use some probably tongs to hold the chicken in place on that big spoon. That's a good tip. That's that a is a good tip. tip. Well, and it's oh. uh, another deal is kind of like a, it's, it's not a spoon, but it's very flat with a lot of holes, but it's, but it's not a colander. But I, oh, I, I know I, what I you mean. It's, that as well. yeah, it's, it's like a big, flat, wide spoon. It's kind of sharp, right? It's kind of it's, it's it's a little sharp, and there it's got a bunch of tiny little holes, and you you can dunk it into the pot, and, and you and raise it up, and you let the, it drip before you actually move the chicken out. It's and not. It's use like any other thing, like a fork or right. some other utensil to hold it in place, so you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> falling over and splashing into your oil. That's it for me. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank you. Um, just real quick also, um, did get a chat. Uh, uh, how can you tell if your meat is done by touch? Uh, a lot of the, actually, Hien's going to go into yeah, absolutely. Uh, into a, a detail on that. Um, and uh, the same techniques that Hien's going to talk about when, you, when you're looking at your meat on uh, a stove, basically the same thing that you're going to look for in a uh, on the on the grill or on the uh, on a smoker as well. But right. I also do, and I also do want to welcome Miss Angie Hall, our senior TES manager. She is on the line tonight as well. So welcome, Miss Angie. And uh, I think that covers it for uh, barbecue and smoking for right now, Eric. Cool. Thank you, Dan. And that is a great segue as far as frying goes because we're gonna go from the deep fryer to the stir fry and the pan fry. And uh, something that Hen really likes to talk about is how she'll take a lot of dishes and stir fries and, and do them on the stove top. And as far as, uh, I wanna add my little two cents. When meat's done, regardless of how you're cooking meat, once it's done, it's done. I mean, meat is, <laughs> It, once it's cooked to that 165 degrees internal temperature, it's cooked. And uh, as Hen's going to talk about, there's an easy way of knowing when a meat is ready to consume. So without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Hen, and she's going to talk to you guys about pan frying and stir frying and, and the like. Take it away. Thank you, Eric. So I like to cook a lot, and I cook almost every day. A lot of the stuff I do, do on the stove as well as in the oven. But on the stove, when I stir fry certain things or pan fry certain things, one of my biggest tips to people is it, when you're stirring, you want to go from the outside and stir in, especially for us who don't have as great a vision. That way we're not throwing food over the side and we're making sure it mixes all together on the inside. Now, as far as meat being done, usually when you stir fry something or you usually have the meat, the vegetables, so you'll always start out with the meat because it's going to be what takes the longest to cook. Now, if you have felt meat uh, with a hand, spatula, fork, when it's raw, it feels very spongy and uh, you can always tell that it's raw by the texture of it and it's not going to break as easily. Once um, meat starts to cook, whether it's ground meat, chicken, anything like that, you can tell the, the doneness by pushing on it. Usually if a meat is done, it's, it's not going to resist as much. If you push on it, it's going to push through. So kind of fall apart or um, you can get your spoon through through the meat without breaking it. If it's, if it's still raw, it's going to resist. It will push back on your silverware or whatever you use to check it with. So that's usually how I can tell when meat's done. Also, you can tell by the smell, really, it, or by like the sound. Usually once meat is starting to really cook and it's, it's getting done, the sizzle gets a little less. 
of a sound. And then you can always smell the difference. If you think about it, like when you cook bacon, you can always tell by the sound and the smell that your bacon is done without having to even touch it. Uh, it's also, back to the stir frying, once you get your meat all done, you can throw your vegetables in. But like I said, one of my biggest tips is always, I use a wok a lot, which is really good because the sides are really high and it's deep, but still, I don't want to fling food out, out the side. So I always make sure that I start from the side and I push my food inwards to try to mix it up that way. And same thing when you like pan fry stuff, you just, you want to be able to use your <clears throat> utensil and find where your meat or whatever is in the pot. And to keep your pot where it should stay, I always hold on to the handle and those awesome gloves that Dan talked about will probably help with that too, especially if you have to walk away and then refine your pan, you can use those gloves to help so you don't end up burning yourself. <clears throat> and those are some of my tips on stir frying. Also, I know people have uh, issues sometimes cutting vegetables and things like that. So I was going to give a tip when you cut a vegetable or meat, whatever hand your knife is in, in that's going to be holding onto the vegetable. I usually will take the side of my finger that's not holding on to whatever I'm cutting and I will lay it against the knife, like the side of the knife, so I can always feel where my knife is going and what my knife is doing. That way I don't lose control and cut my fingers. Uh, also, I wanted to give a few tips on using the oven and baking meats like chicken or salmon and things like that because I know areas to overcook your meat. I have this awesome thing called a Dutch oven. It's kind of like a giant pot that you can put in the oven. I put my chicken and whatever sauce or whatever seasonings. If you don't put any sauce in it, you'll have to put a little bit of olive oil to kind of give it some moisture. But if you just put it in that and just cook your stuff, it will keep the steam in there. So even if you leave it in there longer than you would think, because I know sometimes I get nervous and I'm like, hmm, is my chicken done? Oh, I'll just leave it in there for another 15 minutes. It should be good then. But, but it will not dry out your, your meats by doing that. Also, if you don't have a Dutch oven, you can use the pocket method, which means you will lay out a big piece of foil and put whatever meat in there and <clears throat> just put your seasonings and then like I said you have to do a little bit of olive oil to kind of keep it moist and then you you fold your foil over and it makes a pocket where there's no holes so your steam will also stay inside that pocket and if you you know accidentally leave your meat in there too long it won't dry it out or overcook it so those are some tips that I have on stir frying and and cooking in the oven if anybody has questions on that awesome and and that is those are really good tips because i don't know about that little pocket method i'm going to start trying that myself um so it, definitely cutting and it is another big point of contention for a lot of people, you know, before they even get to the heat that cutting on a cutting board without cutting your hand or your finger off, it's pretty, it's pretty one of the hardest skills to instill in someone doing it safely and doing it efficiently. Because again, when you're cutting meat, and I'm going to talk about this right now, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sauteing and pan, uh, pan searing, pan frying, and just uh, you know, it's just putting piece, small pieces of food on a pan and cooking them because that's one of the, like the more important things you want is when you're cooking something, you want to make sure, especially if they're meats like chicken, that they're all cut up into even chunks <laughs> because if you have pieces that are bigger than other pieces, what might happen is you might undercook the bigger pieces, which is very dangerous. Or you might just burn a bunch of the smaller pieces while your bigger pieces are nice and delicious, but then you have a bunch of junk. 
uh, and so definitely cutting uh, is, is super important, doing it safely and, and doing it precisely or accurately. And, and like Hans said, one of, the, one of the best ways of cutting is to just guiding your knife uh, along the tips of your fingers. So with your right hand, for example, you grip the knife and with your left hand, you sort of put your fingers down with your nails facing outward. So the side of the knife is actually just brushing up against your nails, no skin. So let's say you accidentally <laughs> slip with your knife. All of a sudden it bangs against your nails, not your sensitive flesh. And now you've ruined your meat with your blood and now you've ruined your hand with a knife. So those are very bad things. Uh, as far as sauteing and what saute is, most of you probably already know, but it's just the process of lightly frying food in a little bit of hot oil uh, really, really fast because the food is cut up into small pieces. I do that with fajitas. I cook a lot of fajitas, chicken and beef. Uh, I make sure first, again, that my meat is cut up nice and uniformly, and then I ensure uh, that the meat goes in first. Always have your meat go in first unless you're cooking something that doesn't need much heat like uh, like steak. Obviously, it's going to take a lot less time to cook chopped steak than it is potato scallops or something. <laughs> so a lot of the time, some of the tools I use are like pan, a wok, or a deep pan, a really deep frying pan because it's hard. It's hard to keep everything inside of the inside of the pan, even if you're using that proper technique that Hen mentioned, uh, where you stir the food inward. So it's just good to have another layer between you and the stove top, really, because uh, it makes cleaning a lot easier and it just doesn't put food to waste. Um, so yeah, definitely cons consider buying a wok, even if you're not going to do stir fries, just for everyday frying. I scramble eggs in a wok. <laughs> I mean, I do everything on it. Um, so definitely consider getting one of those. Um, another few tips and tricks that I figured out is uh, if you have a habit of leaving the spoon, the mixing spoon inside the, uh, the, the uh, wok or inside the pan, ensure that you don't buy plastic. Plastic has a really bad tendency of melting. I'd advise buying wooden spoons because those can last a long time inside heat without melting. And you know that nobody wants melted plastic in their chicken breasts and potatoes. Uh, definitely get spoon. The, the only reason I don't recommend metal is because a lot of the modern day pans you buy nowadays have a nonstick Teflon coating and scraping that with metal causes it to like rub off and then it loses its nonstick capabilities. And if any of those little Teflon particles get in your food, it can really mess you up, I think. I heard, I've heard because science tells me so. Um, no, seriously though, uh, it's pretty dangerous to get Teflon in your food. Uh, uh, it's, it's been linked to cancer and stuff. So if, unless you buy stainless steel or, or other like pans that don't have that nonstick to it. And a lot of the, you know, when you buy pans, it'll tell you if it has it. Uh, use wood because again, wood won't burn and melts and it won't kill you by uh, releasing Teflon into your food. Another thing I do is I, I always make sure that my pans don't have, for example, cast iron is nice, but it gets really hot along the handle. So does stainless steel. Make sure that the handles on your food, like Hen said, the handles on your food should be grabbable. You should be able to touch the handles or it, you should be able to touch the handles without finding yourself getting burnt. So something like a metal handle on one of those stainless steel pans, not good, it's gonna burn you. You touch it, it's hot, it conducts heat. Um, so find something with a wooden handle or uh, something that won't hurt you. <laughs> uh, I use gloves too. Those gloves that Dan talks about, uh, they're very nice gloves. I got to see them firsthand. Uh, and the cool thing about some gloves, like they're not standard oven mitts, they're gloves that they're really elastic. So you stick your finger inside, your hand inside, and you can actually still move it around without it uh, feeling like you're trying to grab something through a really thick blanket or something. Yeah, the gloves are really elastic and move. They have great mobility, but definitely 
because, I mean, you're going to knock that pen off course a little bit, and you're going to have to go in and readjust it. So definitely wear a glove on your guiding hand uh, just to avoid getting burnt or to uh, avoid knocking your hand into the food and getting burnt. Finally, another tool I use is just a standard fork. And as Hen talked about, a fork, or what I use is a fork, for meats especially, because when you want to tell when the food is done, I use a fork, I dig at the fork into the thickest part of the meat, and I twist it a little bit. And if the, meat, if the fork tears through that chunk of meat really easily, with very little resistance, then the food is done. You're done those. If you find yourself meeting resistance, like with chicken, man, don't take that chicken out. Give it a little bit more fire because it's not done. The more resistance, the less done the food is. The fewer resistance you come in contact to with, then the, uh, the more, or, or the fewer, the less resistance, the more done it is. So again, you take that fork, just dig it into the meat and twist to the left and right. And if it like sort of shears through the meat, then the meat's pretty good. You're good to go. Uh, finally, the last thing I sort of want to talk about is not overstacking your pan. Uh, that can be a little dangerous with chicken, for example. I know it's really cool to have a lot of food in there at once, but make sure that it's pretty evenly spread out and that uh, the food at the top, when you pour the food in or put the food inside, also comes into contact with the bottom of the pan. Eventually that heat spreads out pretty good, but uh, you wanna make sure that all pieces in that pan come into contact with that hot bottom of the pan at least a you know a couple of times each each piece. Uh, so my suggestion is avoid overstacking, avoid overflowing, just cook in chunks. It's saute, everything's small already, so it doesn't take all that long to cook one batch of something. Uh, so that's sort of how I go about doing things. Like Hen said, grab on, always hold on to that uh, handle. Also, make sure when you're not touching the handle that you sort of spin the handle away from the outside part of the stove, right? Because when you're walking back, the last thing you want to do, and I've seen this at, at Chris Cole, is hit the, the handle and knock the pan off. I mean, the, the worst case scenario is you have all that hot food fall on you and burn yourself with third degree burns or something. Uh, you know, best case scenario, you lose a bunch of food to the floor. And the roaches become your, your house guests. So, Turn the pan so the handle faces inward. And then when you're back to the stove, put that glove on and gently just twist that handle and bring it back around. So that's sort of what I wanted to talk about as far as uh, pan frying and sauteing. I hope that helps you sort of uh, navigate your way around a stove a little bit better. So now let's just take a little bit of time to answer some questions and receive some comments or uh, questions from you guys. Uh, is there any questions in there, Dan? <clears throat> not seeing any questions in the uh, in the chat. Not seeing any question or uh, raised hands or anything at this point. Okay. I will be. I'm glad that uh, y'all did touch a, a bit on the difference between the cast iron and stainless and everything. Right. My wok is actually a big old cast iron deal. I can use it on the barbecue if I want, or I can use mm -hmm. it anywhere where there's heat. But again, there's no handles on it. I have two little handles on there. Mm. And it's really, really important. Anything cast iron, make sure you got a good, uh, a good glove or something that you're Absolutely. able to hang onto that with. And like you were saying too, those gloves that I that that I've got. What is nice about those is there's not a left and a right. It's just whatever hand you want to put it on, the way that they're cut and the way that they're put together. So that was actually something kind of nice I noticed uh, actually this weekend when I was using them. So. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm glad that, uh, that y'all hit on, on the difference between cast iron and stainless there in the, in the knot cool. stick. Some very good tips there. Any questions awesome. from all folks? Any questions at all folks? This will be available, uh, within the next couple of days. We will have, uh, this recording out there just so that y'all know, but, uh, definitely don't be afraid to ask any questions or suggestions or anything like that at all right now. Remember, Alt H, Alt Y to raise your hand. 
while we wait for questions, I do want to reach out to the, all of you. First of all, all of you listening and watching us uh, today, thank you so much for tuning in. And to anyone watching and listening to us in the future off of our archives, we want to thank you for checking us out. Long time, first time listeners, thank you so much. Uh, we hope to help you guys with anything, any aspect of, of being blind and adjusting and transitioning or just picking up new tips and tricks on everyday, day-to-day -day life as, as a person with a visual impairment. It's a little bit different, but everything that your sighted peers can do, we can also do, except for drive, yeah. So I also want to reach out to Dr. Laura Miller from Northwest Eye. Uh, is it Eye Center, Dan? Yes, Northwest Eye Center. Uh, vision. Uh, and all of the patients that she's brought to us, we thank you so much for your support and for uh, sticking with us. So, one more time, one last time. Any questions or comments? You know, myself and Dan Hart, any of your questions, even outside of this uh of, of, of this webinar questions comments or suggestions for future topics you can mail me eric c fuentes at eric dot c fuentes at austinlighthouse.org or dan dot hart at austinlighthouse.org we will respond to you asap and take anything you say seriously and implement it into the into the presentations for the future uh, again handouts are available they will be released very soon after this presentation. Any questions, Dan? <clears throat> uh, not that I am seeing. Oh, I got one hand. Hang on one moment. Uh, oh, oh. Who's got the one hand up? Let me see here. OK, it's one of our <laughs> phone callers. Hang on one moment. All righty. One of our hand. 45 or 5402. Go ahead with your uh, question. Oh no. Well, I'm trying to unmute. Not click the unmute and it is not unmuting. Oh no, we do apologize for that. Technology doesn't always comply. <laughs> yeah. And unmute and it's not, oh, no. Yeah, it's not allowing me to unmute. Well. That is very odd. We do apologize for that. If you do want to uh, ask the question, please do email us. Uh, and we do hope, maybe we hope to uh, have a question line for the future uh, for phone callers, people who don't have access to an email account. Uh, I think that's sort of something we've been kicking around. So we do apologize for that. You see any uh, other hands or questions, Dan? No. Uh, right now, I do not. Okay. Well, I think then that's a good place to wrap it up. We thank you so much to everyone joining us today and to all future listeners. Again, email us any questions, comments, or future suggestions for topics. The emails will be in the handouts. Eric Fuentes or Dan Hart at AustinLighthouse.org. Thank you so much, and everyone have a wonderful night. Goodbye. <clears throat>
Hey, stand, stand by, stand by just a second. I'm trying to end the call right now. I'm trying to end the meeting right now. Stand by. Stand by. Perfect. Hang on one second here. We can't get this to any controls. Okay. Stand by. 